important. Uh, the landscape around uh, revenue and revenue options. And Gail, are we, uh, oh, we are live, okay, <coughs> excellent. So how, we just had that question, how, is there a way to tell by looking at the screen when we're live and when we're not live? I know in our legislative committees, there usually is, but. There is. But if, is, if, if the teleprompter is working, we are live. No, we've been told that that's not true. Okay, because that's what I assumed and turned out to, to be true. Okay. And as soon as it was turned off, the teleprompter stopped. No, I, can, I can do it either or. Okay, well, no. good. <laughs> but I will certainly remember because I tended to remember in my own committee room, we need to go off live before. Yes, we so maybe we should have we should just check and make sure we're offline before we start yakking and taking breaks and stuff. So, sorry about that. I just, okay. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, it's, this is my first time being back in the state house and speaking to a, a group of people. So it's, uh, <laughs> there might be a little bit of rust at the beginning, but hopefully it, um, it shakes off. My name is Graham Campbell. I'm a senior fiscal analyst at the joint fiscal office. Um, I am the person in our office primarily who looks at non-property, non-transportation tax revenues. So no diesel, no diesel taxes, no gasoline taxes, no property taxes, but everything else kind of fits under my jurisdiction. So um, if you have questions about those taxes, transportation is Chris, property is Mark Peralt, but everything else is me. So um, I guess I'm here to maybe bring a little bit more of an uplifting presentation than what Steve just finished out on. That's kind of the way it works <laughs> in Steve's uh, <laughs> compact top situation. Um, my presentation is going to be, um, a lot of it's going to be informative, just essentially very basic tax things. How do taxes work in the state? And then I'm also going to be talking about, um, you know, revenue options, who pays the taxes um, that we talk about, especially some of the big ones. Um, and I'm happy to take questions throughout the entire presentation, but um, you'll be seeing a lot of basic terms that some of you may know, some of you may not know, but I think it's, um, in my experience, it's helpful for people who don't necessarily live in tax world all the time to sort of see some of these things before, um, you know, we start getting into the weeds. So without much further ado, so um, sort of talked about this just now, but the way this is going to work is I imagine it, and I've given sort of similar presentation like this for us. Think about one of those bus tours you see in big cities um, where people are sitting on the roof and they're looking at the various sites. That's how this is going to sort of work, where we're going to do quick stops at some of the big taxes, the major landmarks, I call them, the personal income tax, the sales tax, and the corporate income tax. Um, but we're, we're not necessarily going to dive deep into the full-on concepts. I'm happy to take questions on those if you have them. But um, we're not going to get into, you know, really, really deep um, corporate income taxation stuff today. Um, and then we're going to, after you do those three major landmarks, I'm going to look at some other revenue types quickly and talk about some potential revenue options that um, Chris related to this, this um, task force has discussed um, and talk about some of the issues there. And then I'm going to wrap up with what we call tax expenditures or um, sort of things that um, you know, artificially lower the amount of money that we collect and through policy choices um, or just um, general, you know, favoritism toward one particular group or thing. So the first stop on this bus uh, tour is going to be at tax school. So this is the basic part of this presentation that we're going to quickly touch upon before we get into the needy greed um, stuff. So basically, when you think about taxes, everything comes down to this basic equation of three parts, the tax base times the rate equals the liability of two parts on the left side of this equation and then the liability on the other side. So the, the basic part that I want to portray from this, um, this equation is that the bigger the base, the lower the rate you can have to raise a certain amount of revenue. And or you can have a high rate and a small base to raise a certain amount of revenue. Uh, revenue. Um, so basically everything that I'm talking about today, you're going to hear about rates, you're going to hear about the tax base. Tax rates and tax base are two distinctly different things. Um, and if you wanna raise revenue, you can either raise the increase the size of the base or you can increase the rate base. That's more or less what I wanna portray here. So beginning on the left side of that equation, um, on the next slide now, the tax base is generally defined as what is included in the statutory language minus any exemptions deductions. So let's, let's talk about the sales tax as an example. 
the tax base for the sales tax is what's called tangible personal property. Um, and tangible personal property is sort of a fancy term for goods, more or less. So, you know, things that you can touch and hold um, are, are included as part of the base. The value of that sort of tangible personal property is the tax base, minus any exemptions and deductions from that base. So I have this little sort of handy um, pie chart here that sort of shows you the tax base if we tax everything um, and then exemptions and deductions. Now, that's distinct from things like, so if we think about the, the tax base or the sales tax, tangible personal property is the base. But something like services is not considered a deduction or an exemption. It's just not part of the tax base. It's not tangible personal property. It's not part of the definition. Another example would be in income taxes. We don't consider things like um, housing wealth to be part of the um, personal income tax because income is defined in statute as you know capital gains, wages, salaries, pensions, things like that. Housing wealth is not one of those. So we're not necessarily excluding um, housing wealth from the personal income tax, it's just not part of the tax base. So <clears throat> touching upon that theme a little more, an exemption is sort of an ex a systemic um, exclusion, systematic exclusion from the tax. It is usually limited to a particular group of taxpayers. So the example I have here is the property tax, right? The property tax, the base is the value of all property in the state, a commercial, residential, and otherwise. But most, most libraries are statutorily exempt from paying the tax, even if their property would otherwise be taxable. So we have a line in statute that says libraries are not part of the tax base. And that's an exemption we're pulling out of the base and therefore reducing our base, reducing our revenue. If you think back to that equation. So most exemptions can be full or they can be partial. So full exemptions obviously cost more. We go back to the library exemption. We exempt all libraries from the sales tax. We don't say, in, the, in a version of a partial exemption, we don't say if the value of the library is over 500,000, then it has to pay tax or something like that. Um, another example of a partial exemption would be in Vermont in the income tax, we um, exempt a portion of social security income, but not all of it, depending upon tree income. So <clears throat> that is different from a deduction, which is an amount that an individual is taxpayer themselves is, is permitted to subtract from their tax base. So um, a good example of this is if you think about your personal income tax, your base is your income that you made that year, but you can deduct certain things from that income. So an example of that would be if you on your federal tax, you were itemizing your deduction, you're allowed to deduct your mortgage interest that you paid that year. And that lowers your income, lowering your base and lowering the liability that you have to pay. So for the individual, it lowers the liability. From the state's perspective, that lowers, that, that costs us money. So there's, there's a difference between exemption and deduction. Deduction is typically something we talk about at the individual level, not on sort of a, a wide scale policy level. So the second part of that equation is tax rates. So they can be fixed or they can be tiered. Sales taxes is 6% in Vermont. It is applied uniformly across all tangible personal property minus the exemptions that we have, it's one rate. Vermont's income taxes are an example of tiered rates. So typically in a tiered rate structure, you have a series of brackets with whatever is the tax base going through those brackets. And most tiered brackets are structured in a way to be progressive so that the tax liability for the individual increases as you, you know, have more and more tax base to be taxed. So that's the classic part of you know, the personal income tax, the marginal tax bracket structure. And the taxpayer only pays the assigned rate for the each dollar within that tax bracket. So I'm gonna explain how that works. So you will often hear in sort of tax policy, two different terms, the marginal tax rate and the effective tax rate. These are extremely important terms um, for talking about. And um, quite frankly, the more, more important one to think about is the effective tax rate. But I'll start with marginal tax rate. So we have this example here of a tax bracket. You see that zero to 10,000 is 10% rate, 10,000 and $1 to 100,000 pays 10%, 100,000 to a million pays 15, a million plus pays 20%. So if you hear about someone saying, what is your marginal tax bracket, tax rate? What we're talking about here is the, is the tax rate paid on the last dollar in that, on your income. So if someone here, example, makes $20,000 in income, they go through that first bracket, that 5% bracket, but 
what ends up happening is that $20,000 falls into that second bracket. And so their marginal tax rate, the last dollar of the 20,000 is paying 10%. So their marginal rate is 10%. So what you'll hear a lot, particularly from um, sort of uh, more people who wanna sort of make the tax system seem harsher than it is, is they'll say, you know, Vermont has the highest tax rate in the country. It's top rate is 8.75%. That's sort of saying that that is the highest marginal rate you can pay on the highest dollar in Vermont. If you are, you know, have a very high income, that's what you're gonna be paying on that last dollar. But for the vast majority of taxpayers, that is not, they're not paying 8.75 on the entirety of their income. What is more, I think, instructive for policymakers is to look at the effective tax rate. And that's the actual rate of tax liability for the entire, the actual rate of tax for the entire liability. So an equation there is basically how much tax liability you have over how much total base you have. So in the income tax, how much tax are you paying after you calculate your tax over how much income you have? And that's the effective tax rate. So if we look at the taxpayer with 20,000 in income, the first 10,000 is gonna be taxed at 5% based upon that bracket. So they're gonna pay $500 on that first 10,000. And then because they have 20,000, they're bumping into that second bracket. And so they're gonna pay 10% on that next 10,000. So $1,000 in that next 10,000. So overall, they're paying $1,500 in taxes in this hypothetical example. They have $20,000 of income. That's the denominator here. They're paying an effective tax rate of 7.5%. So essentially saying they're paying 7.5% of their income um, in taxes. That's, you know, when I talk about personal income tax and, and lots of other um, taxes, I'm, I almost always refer to the effective rates that people pay. Um, so, but you will hear people talk about what is the highest, well, you know, what's the highest tax rate, what's the marginal tax rate in a various state. But what really matters is how much people are paying as a percentage of their income throughout the income distribution. So once we calculate the liability, we have things that reduce that liability. So we're on that right side of the equation right now. Um, tax rate times base equals liability. So we're on the liability side now. So one, something that can reduce um, liability is credit. So credits always reduce the liability. They don't reduce the tax base, like a deduction or an exemption. But in a credit is amount that reduces the tax liability. It does not reduce, as I said. Credits can either be refundable or non-refundable. So a refundable credit means that a taxpayer receives a payment from the state if the credit reduces their liability to below zero. So imagine you had someone with a $100 tax liability, but $150 refundable credit. What that means is that the $150 credit will wipe out that tax liability, but then the state or federal government or whoever's the taxing authority will issue a payment to that person of $50. Versus a non-refundable credit, which can reduce the liability to zero, but not any further. So in that same example, um, if the $150 is a non-refundable credit, we're gonna have a zero liability, but it's not gonna, no one's gonna be getting a payment from the state. They might be able to carry forward that unused credit, that $50 in future tax years, depending on the credit. But generally you're not like, you're not paying the person um, if they have more credit than liability. So examples of that are fundable credit. The biggest one in Vermont is the earned income tax credit. And in fact, we, the state issues payments to um, a very large number of taxpayers, about 45,000 taxpayers tax returns in Vermont receive a payment from the state largely because of the earned income tax credit, because that is a refundable credit, drive, drive your liability to zero. And then, you know, if you have um, more credit than tax liability, you'll get a payment. An example of a non-refundable credit is we have a charitable tax credit in Vermont, 5% um, credit for up to $20,000 of contributions, but that can only wipe out your liability to zero. It can't, you know, you're not gonna be getting a payment from the state after that. So that's the end of tax school. Does anyone have any questions before we start to get into the nitty gritty? Did we all pass? <laughs> no, we're shaking your heads. So <laughs> up and down, or nodding your heads rather, I should say. So the rest of this briefing is basically gonna go, we're gonna go through tax types and we're gonna talk about what is it? How much do we collect? Who pays it? And then just what's new, you know, what's interesting stuff going on here and how has COVID-19 affected this revenue stream? Um, and I'll sort of, we have, we're going to have new information tomorrow based upon Tom's forecast that will maybe highlight a little bit um, in this direction, but basically what I'm telling you now is maybe a little bit outdated, but the general trends I think will be sort of 
be continuing. So the first place we're going to start is the personal income tax. Um, this page here essentially shows you the U.S. 1040, the federal 1040. That's, that's the U.S. standard personal income tax form, the Vermont IN 111, and, um, which is the Vermont equivalent. So um, maybe ask me, why, why am I showing you tax forms? Um, and the reason is because I think it's instructive to sort of show what the base here is in Vermont. So the way it works in Vermont is we grab items off of the federal return as the sort of starting place for Vermont's personal income tax. So if you look at this 1040 with the red boxes highlighted here, you can see that the first things you fill out are your wages and salaries, your tax exempt interest, your qualified dividends, your IRAs, your social security benefits, capital gains, and then other income. That is the base, the starting place for um, the personal income tax. And it all starts on the federal return. You put down a number there um, of the sum of those things. And that essentially becomes what Vermont picks up. The second small box there is the adjusted gross income. Adjusted gross income more or less tracks the sum of every one's individual pieces of income, but there are some adjustments that are made after that. So for instance, if you're a teacher, you can take um, educator expense deduction prior to adjusted gross income. So you calculate your income, take some small deductions, um, and then it, your adjusted gross income will likely be smaller than your total income. But the big ones that you hear about, you know, the charitable deduction, the mortgage interest, the um, medical deduction, those are itemized deductions on the federal return. Those are after adjusted gross income. So in tax world, generally, we consider adjusted gross income to be the best measure or a very good measure of people's income or ability to pay. Um, so you'll see charts in the a later part of the presentation that are broken out by adjusted gross income group. But adjusted gross income is a very important term because <clears throat> It is the starting place for Vermont's income taxes. You can see here on this sort of flow chart, you have a, a blue box, the adjusted gross income box, which comes off in the federal 1040. And then basically we're all on Vermont's forms. Um, what Vermont says is it says, okay, take your adjusted gross income and make some subtractions from that. So first thing that you do is you take a standard deduction, which is more or less an adjustment for the type of filer that you are. So you can deduct 6250, um, this is tax year 20, if you're a single filer or 12,500 for a married filer. You also subtract 4350 for you, your spouse and any dependent as a personal exemption. And then there are other subtractions that Vermont puts into its tax codes. So the, big, the big ones here are the capital gains exclusion. So if you make capital gains income, you can either subtract $5,000 or 40% of the capital gain if it's from the sale of an investment property a business or farm in timberland. Things like stocks and bonds are not eligible for the 40%, but they are eligible for 5,000. The social security exemption is a, is a full exemption of social security benefits up to, oh, I need to remember these, I think it's $40,000 of AGI, just a gross income for single filers and 55 for married couplers, married couples. So you're taking your, your just a gross income, you're subtracting these, um, these items. And then we make you add back some, some certain things here. And for the majority of Vermont taxpayers, they're not adding back very much. So <laughs> this Vermont state local bonds, that's exempt at the federal level, but we're not, we don't want to give people a double dip on Vermont. So that's why we sort of make them add it back. And you come up with this term called Vermont taxable income. And that is the measure that gets put through the bracket. So what I want to portray here is that when you hear someone say, I make $85,000 a year, what you don't want to do is say, okay, 85000 and then look at the brackets, because that is not what gets put through the brackets. What gets put through the brackets is your taxable income, which is after your standard deduction, after your personal exemption, after any other subtraction. So um, <clears throat> the Vermont taxable income is almost always lower um, than adjusted gross income for all taxpayers. So Vermont taxable income gets put through the brackets, as we've talked about in Basically here at the, the single and married filing jointly brackets from Vermont, Vermont has four tax tax brackets, even though it looks like five here, just this is from the Vermont Department of Taxes. They help you calculate how much you owe if you make under, if you have taxable income under 75,000, but it's four brackets with rates of 3.35 up to up to 67,450 for a married couple and 40,350 for a single individual. So again, if you think about those taxable income brackets, these people's actual income is probably closer in that bottom bracket, probably closer to something like eighty, eighty-five thousand um, dollars, depending upon the size of their family, um, <coughs> their filing. Um, 
for a married couple and then for the single filer probably somewhere around 50,000 is probably what you um, in actual income so 3.35 and then it goes up to 6.6% 7.6% and then 8.75 for the highest bracket. And so you'll notice there that, um, you know, you have sort of a lot of income at the bottom bracket. And then as you, after that, it starts to pick up quite quickly. Um, that's a, that's a, I think, relatively unique trait about Vermont's personal income tax structure is it sort of is very, quite low rates for in a lot of individuals. And then once you start to make higher incomes, it picks up pretty quickly. And I'll show you a graph to illustrate that. So after you put your income into the brackets, you come up with your initial Vermont tax liability. And then once you come up with your tax liability, then it's a matter of looking at your credits. So you have your non-refundable credits, the big one there being the charitable tax credit, but there's also a, a non-refundable credit based upon the federal child independent care credit. Then the refundable credits are the biggest one is by far the earned income tax credit. And so that reduces your liability. And the final step of all this, and this is a key point, is the Vermont apportionment percentage. So for the vast majority of Vermont resident taxpayers, that apportionment is going to be 100%. The amount of income that is Vermont-based is going to be 100%. If you earn wages in Vermont, the only source, and that's the only source of your income, it's 100%. But for high-income taxpayers, that number changes a lot. Um, one of the examples the Department of Taxes often gives is Oprah. Oprah might make a billion dollars in a given year. Let's say she comes to Vermont and makes $100,000 speaking at a book event. Oprah's going to file a Vermont tax return, and she's going to post her adjusted gross income saying, my income's a billion dollars. But what she's actually going to be taxed on is closer is 100000 because that was the Vermont-based portion of this. So for a lot of high-income taxpayers, you will see apportionment percentages kind of all over the map, particularly those who are and this has become a bigger issue nowadays with remote working, right? What does that Vermont apportionment percentage become if you're, you know, working for a Boston-based employer, but you're working in Vermont, right? Some states have interpreted that to say, well, no, that's Boston-based income. Like um, Massachusetts is basically saying, you know, if you're working in Vermont and you're working for a Boston-based employer, that's Massachusetts income. But Vermont says, if you're living and working in Vermont, doesn't matter where your business is, that's Vermont-based income. So... That's more or less how we calculate Vermont personal income taxes. Um, that's sort of the what is it question of this briefing. So personal income tax, how much do we collect? <laughs> we collect we're, we've eclipsed the $1 billion mark on personal income taxes um, in fiscal year 21. And this blue line here shows you what it's been like since 2005, not adjusted for inflation. Um, but this is sort of what we've collected. That dashed line is the January 2021 forecast. We're getting a new one tomorrow. Um, but to give you an idea of how good of a year personal income tax it was, that triangle tells you how much we've sort of beaten the forecast in this year 21. So we beat the forecast by $124 million um, in fiscal year 21. And right now, the personal income tax represents about 60% of available general fund revenue. So it is by far the biggest fish in, in, the, um, in the general fund. It's available for all the spending that Steve has talked about. Um, so we really watch the personal income tax a lot. And that number is growing over time. As you can see, it was something like 40, 48% back in 2005. Yeah, now it's 60%. And then um, I think my conversations with Tom Cabet have sort of said that that's going to keep growing because personal income tax is Sure. Yes. Uh, so, what went into that large increase then? Uh, that 124 million above forecast. What kind of what were the factors that created that? Yeah. So, um, I think the biggest thing, I think the broad um, explanation of Tom that would say that he's related to me is just the amount of federal money that is poured into the economy has just shaken out in so many different ways. So, a good example is with um, wage earners who lost their job during the um, uh, tax year 2020, so tax years January to December, they were receiving bonus unemployment insurance. So oftentimes they were making more money than they were when they were employed. So what we saw during last year and this year is that the largest withholding account, um, basically for taxes. So when you work, your your uh, taxes are withheld by the tax department of taxes. The largest withholding account of the department of taxes was the Vermont Department of Labor which basically means they were the biggest wage taxpayer in the state um, for the past, for at least certainly during 2019, but like into 2020. So what we saw there was we saw higher withholding numbers within the personal income tax, which means that they were beating what we thought they were going to do. 
Another thing that we saw a lot of, and I'll touch upon that, um, I don't know, I think two slides down is um, what we call estimated payments in the personal income tax. So if you have a business um, and you're paying to the personal income tax, you have big capital gains, you have rental income, um, the IRS requires you, if you have a certain amount of it, to pay your taxes quarterly. And so those are what we call estimated payments. And those estimated payments were significantly higher than we thought. So what that tells us initially, we don't have the data yet, but that sort of hints at very strong business income in tax year 2020 and very high capital gains in tax year 2020. Um, and, you know, that's sort of backed up by things like the market. We know the asset prices um, are very high right now. And so a lot of that is federally driven. So you have, um, you know, you might imagine a, a company that sells home improvement stuff. Those companies did quite well during the recession. You know, they might have ended up with very large tax liability at the end of the year, personal income tax. Um, you know, you think about how um, monetary policy, the Federal Reserve has lowers interest rates, has inflated asset prices, um, large capital gains. That shows up. So I think the early explanations point to things like business income, capital gains, which are pretty much exclusively high income taxpayers. Um, so. Um, another thing that we sort of thought about is new people moving into Vermont. There's just not enough data there to tell us whether this is new people. So I think the biggest thing we would say is business income, capital gains, and then um, federal stimulus, which is driving things like bonus unemployment. Well, Usually, the, yeah. I think the key too is that it's not adjusted for inflation. So it's incomes and other prices have inflated. Yep. You know, it, it may look like it's bigger, but the real purchasing power of that 124 million might not be what it was. That's a year or two ago. Totally true. Yeah. Um, I would say over this time period, particularly post recession, inflation has been like one, two percent. So, I mean, we could adjust this for inflation, but I think you'd still see record levels of income tax coming in. Um, but, you know, for the state purposes, that what we really matter is what the actual dollars that flow into the treasury. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a good point to think about the actual buying power, particularly if we're investing in so many things if there's a lot of inflation in say construction then that you know drives down the value of what we can get for our dollar spent i don't want to uh, spoil what comes out tomorrow but do you have a sense of whether this uh uh period in the triangle is going to represent an outlier or is it gonna um be more of a, a base where um revenues continue to grow from you know is, is the trend going to come back towards that line or is it going to continue from that that trend. My conversation with Tom was to talk about this sort of being a, a level shift, but what Steve talked about is even once you have that level shift, he's he's looking at like two and a half percent. So you might have this one up and then two and a half, you know. So I wouldn't say expect a ton, you know, a bunch of positive surprises in the future. Um, it looks like you know we are in right now at least in a very good time for personal income tax but the actual growth every year looks like as steve mentioned about two and a half percent um so i would describe it at least what steve's told me what tom's told me is more of a level shift sort of like up and then up slowly but not like a up, 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 up. the base may shift the base will probably shift but the trajectory won't continue correct but i would say also that this is and this is something i touch on later and is this is a volatile income source particularly if you're becoming more and more reliant on high income taxpayers so you know, the out forecast might be something like two and a half percent, but if, you know, just as we beat the forecast by $124 million, which is, you know, about 10, 15%, you know, in a given year in the recession, we were off by 10, 15% in the other direction, right? Um, and uh, again, sort of hinting at what I'm going to talk about later is that as you become more and more progressive as an income tax, the more and more sensitive you are to those things, because the income of very high income taxpayers is really driven by things like capital gains, which come and go in a given year. And that's why it's so hard to predict oftentimes the person income tax, because the more and more reliant on things that are unpredictable, like capital gains, the more and more you're going to miss your forecast in either direction. So, and it could just be things like, you know, not just, you know, a bad year for capital gains, but things like, let's say the Fed say they're going to impose higher capital gains rates next year. What people do is they start realizing all of a sudden this year, and you get a huge wave of capital gains. You're like, wow, we're doing great. And the next year, they're off a cliff, right? Because no one realizing in the high um, tax rate regime. So these things are very sensitive to federal policy, economic conditions, um, and they're increasingly more difficult to predict. So, and this kind of highlights this next page with bar graphs. So this is kind of a, 
I wouldn't call it my best chart, but I try to convey a lot of information here. But the blue bars show you how many millions of dollars of personal income tax we collect from each one of these adjusted gross income groups. So you can see, you know, we have the income groups on the bottom and how many millions of dollars we collect. And then on top of those bars, that represents the amount of the percentage of returns in that group. So if we look at the far left, 31% of our tax returns have negative or $25,000 less than adjusted gross income, but they represent a negative portion of our month income tax, which means that we are, you know, for a huge portion of those, they are an aggregate, we're issuing payments to them, to the 31% of our total tax returns. And then if you go on the far end, you see that we collected, you know, roughly $300 million from 2% of total tax returns. 2% corresponds to a just under three hundred thousand dollars in AGI, around yeah, well, about three hundred thousand, and we. Um, but that's about thirty six percent of our total income taxes comes from two percent of our taxpayer population. So these numbers, I've been updating this chart since I've been here. I've been here five years. These numbers become smaller at the bottom end and become bigger. A lot of that, some of that is due to inflation. So, you know, more and more people are just gonna be making more money over time. So more and more people are gonna end up in these higher brackets, but there is definitely been a shift beyond inflation towards more high income tax payers paying more burden in Vermont on personal income tax. Yes. Give uh, the numbers of how many people fall into each of these ranges here. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. We have about, 330,000 tax returns. So 30% of 30,000 or 330,000 is, you know, 40, 50,000 tax returns. These are tax returns, not people. Um, so um, sometimes it won't even represent a household. You might have, you know, people filing separately. Um, so um, yeah, generally we're all talking tax returns here. Okay. Yeah. And you said that was 330,000 roughly? Resident returns. Yeah. And that's what this is based upon. Do you know how these numbers compare to other states to the feds? Uh, I don't know to the feds. Um, hopefully one of my other charts will help illuminate that a bit. Um, two down, I'll show you okay. how that compares to other states. Okay. I think general, the, the thing I would say is um, Vermont's is probably the most progressive in New England. Um, and New England already has a relatively progressive type of income tax. Um, system as a whole across all the states with the exception of Hampshire, they don't have an income tax. Um, but yeah, Vermont, as I talked earlier, is, very, is low for a huge number of taxpayers. And, but once you sort of hit about 100,000, then it starts to get pretty steep. Um, I'll show that in two slides. But this is kind of what that talks about this slide here. This is the effective tax rate for Vermont taxpayers in all of these income groups. So this tells you essentially what is the share of their income that they're paying in personal income taxes. And you can see for in aggregate for those with under 25,000 is just a gross income. In general, we are issuing payments to them of about one to one and a quarter percent of their income. So roughly, you know, the average earning income tax credit is about $600, $700. So that's a major poverty fighting tool in Vermont. Um, it's one of the most generous in the country. But you can see, you know, as you sort of make your way up in the income distribution, people are, are paying more and more um, uh, of their income in personal income tax. And you, at about 100,000, you can see the line gets a lot steeper. And that's the structure of the, the income tax brackets and the nature of what deductions we allow for high income taxpayers. So in this middle group, you know, the value of those deductions is quite hot and it is, you know, it wipes out a good chunk of their income. Um, for high income taxpayers, you know, $12,000 standard deduction if you're making $300,000 is pretty much worthless um, in the grand scheme of things. So you see that steepness after $100,000. Um, and so by the top, you're paying about 6.4%. There's, I get a lot of questions about why that dips at the end. Um, the reason that is, is for the, ca is the capital gains exclusion. People with a million dollars in AGI often have large capital gains. And because we give those that group a 40% exclusion, you see that dip. And so I would emphasize that those people are not just earning capital gains every single year. I would say that a good chunk of them are people who make normal, normal AGI in a given year. They sell their business, they sell their farm, um, which is their pension or retirement, which they might be using as an asset for retirement. And they make a million, but the problem is that not problem. The way of income works is that gets counted as income. So one year you might have 90,000, next year you have 
1.25 million. And that's one of the reasons, one of the policy reasons behind giving a 40% exclusion for that group. Yeah. So because of these capital gain deductions, do you have a, and I know you said they're hard to account for in a given year, do you have a general sense of how much potential revenue we miss out on yes. um, from not collecting on those? So the cost of that tax expenditure runs between 15 to $20 million a year. So we know that for a fact. A couple of years ago, I did a study on the capital gains exclusion about the people who take it, you know, who takes it. The vast majority of the dollars of that 15 to 20 million comes from high income taxpayers. Um, like 90% of it comes from high income taxpayers. Um, and what we found is that, you know, you might still, one of the reasons this was put in place is for those one time events for normal taxpayers. But what we found is that um, it is often taken more than once. Um, from people. So um, I think something like half of the people who had taken the capital gains exclusion over the prior five years have taken it more than once. So it's not, we're not talking about a one time sale and asset. It might be two times, but people definitely take it more than once. And it's definitely not farm sales, is one thing we ruled out. Um, the total amount of the exclusion, only about less than 4% of the, the dollars were from returns that had any farm income whatsoever. So you know, either people are, you know, my guess on the capital gains exclusion, we can talk about it more in detail, is that a lot of it is investment property um, and business sales. So, but that's why you see that dip. And I would mention that that dip, we have scaled back the capital gains exclusion. We did it in 2018 or 19. That dip has gotten smaller. So it used to be like a dip from 6.4 to about the high fives. Now it's pretty close back up to um, 6.4. So, yeah. Um, you answered two of my questions, which was why does that dip? And then also, is it really all, you know, one time farm, family farm, or are there other uh, expenses? It seems like mostly other. Is that report that you did on the capital gains exclusion, is that publicly available? Yep. Yeah. It is uh, part of the 2019 tax expenditure report, and I can send it um, to, to Gail who can distribute it. Thank you. That'd be great to take a look at. So the moral of this chart is that basically we have a quite progressive tax system um, already in place. And this next chart shows you how that compares to New England as a whole. Um, so this was data from our 2017 tax study report. We do a big overview of the tax system every 10 years. We're um, statutorily required to do so. And this is from 2013 and 14. So a little bit outdated, but it shows you how effective tax rates go through the income distribution for New England. So you can see in Vermont, if you have HEI below 100,000, which is about 85% of tax returns, you have on average the lowest personal income tax burden in the state. It's only after that 100,000, you can see that steep um, incline, such that by the time you're a $500,000 million taxpayer, you're sort of you know, amongst the sort of New England average. But you can see that also that dip was a lot sharper in 2013, 14 than it is nowadays. And that's because we've scaled back that capital gains exclusion. Um, and we sort of changed our tax system as a whole, which I'll sort of touch upon on the couple of slides from now. So, yeah. So even though this is from 2013, 2014, is it still pretty similar? Today? Yeah, yeah. I can't speak to, so basically no state in New England has increased their taxes um, under 100,000. So you might see some more steepness from other states, but um, I'm, I'm trying to think about the states that I follow. Maybe Connecticut has done something, but I can't think of any other states that drastically increased their taxes on high income taxpayers, such that they would, you know, outshine us or, you know, make this chart any different significantly. So I can't remember where it came from, but a few years ago when we were looking at some tax policies, um, Vermont was ranked fifth in the nation, I think, for progressive tax rates. Yeah, I've seen a report on that. So the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, sort of a, I call it more a left-leaning think tank in Washington. They produced this report called Who's, Who Pays, and it covers all taxes. Um, and they, what they essentially do is they try to estimate the effective tax rate for taxpayers across all the income distribution, accounting for not just personal income tax, but sales taxes and property taxes, everything like that. And what they found is that our system 
largely because of the personal income tax and what we exempt in our sales tax was the second most progressive um, uh, state in the country. States that rely heavily on sales tax on the hand were, and property taxes were, were sort of called very regressive states. So does everyone know what those terms mean, progressive and regressive? Basically, you're, if you're a progressive system, you're, the share of your income paid in taxes is higher. Um, so certain taxes, the way you structure them, can be more progressive. And that's what this, um, you know, our income tax system is. So, so what's new in the personal income tax? So we've touched a little bit on this, but back in 2018, you'll recall the Trump administration had a huge federal tax reform that they put in place. And that sort of necessitated a major change at the Vermont level, because prior to that, Vermont's tax system was more intricately linked with the federal system. So we didn't start with adjusted gross income. We started with federal taxable income. And that's a big deal because we were essentially picking up all the federal deductions like mortgage interest and the charitable deduction, things like that. Um, we were picking up the federal personal exemption, which got wiped down in the tax reform. So what in preliminary modeling of how that was going to affect us, what we found was that even though the federal government lowered their taxes a lot, at the federal level, the sort of getting rid of the deductions that they had they, they did at the federal level was actually going to cause taxes in Vermont to go up uh, for taxpayers, particularly for families, because that personal exemption that they wiped out. So we found that in aggregate, about $30 million of extra tax liability was going to accrue to Vermonters. And I think in one of the sort of more inspiring things in my time at the legislature, there was a real bipartisan effort to, to sort of turn things back to the way they were. So the tax department and the administration put together a tax proposal, which its goal was to essentially keep people the same as they were. Um, and the, it came to the legislature and the legislature made some, some minor tweaks to make the system slightly more progressive, but by and large, um, we decoupled completely from the federal code. So the only place that we really link up heavily in the, in the federal code is adjusted gross income. No longer are we picking up all these federal deductions and stuff like that. Um, and we boosted some of our existing progressivity. So um, one of the things we did was we made the, um, the earned income tax credit slightly larger in that um, change. Um, we scaled, we did no longer allow a charitable deduction that carried through from the federal, but we allowed for a charitable tax credit of 5%, which was available to everyone. So people at the lower end who gave to charity would get some benefit. But the, the part that made it more progressive is we capped the amount available for that credit at $20,000 of contributions. So a lot of high income taxpayers give a lot of money to charity. Um, and so that sort of cap um, ended up being sort of a tax increase for them. So modest, modestly more progressive at the end of that 2018. Um, another change that we made that's not in on this slide was the, was the scale back of capital gains exclusion, which took place in 2019. Um, used to be that that 40% exclusion was available unlimitedly. So you could have $10 million of gains and we give you 40%. Now the maximum exclusion you can have on the capital gains exclusion is $350,000. After that, there's no more. So that's why you see for those really high income taxpayers that sort of tick back up and their um, progressivity or tick, tick back up in terms of their tax liability. And we've touched a little bit on this. So how has COVID-19 affected this? So uh, we've seen record personal income tax payments, but um, particularly in estimated tax payments since basically March 2020, since the pandemic began, but they've smashed record. And this, we think, is sort of a reflection of this K-shaped recovery that everyone's been talking about, where you have a lot of people sort of staying flatlined and some people doing really well. So strong business income, capital gains, the bonus unemployment also likely boosted withholding payments a lot. And then we've talked a little bit about people moving to Vermont and working remotely. That we think that's primarily a high income taxpayer type of situation, but we have we don't have the data yet to say whether that's a big deal. And quite frankly, I don't think that that's going to be a big thing um, unless they are really wealthy and they're working in Vermont because um, you know, the numbers that we're seeing in school districts are just not big enough to indi indicate, you know, 2,000 high income taxpayers coming to the state. Um, but say if, you know, even just 15, because we're such a small state, 15 really high income taxpayers move here, that can move the needle quite a bit on personal income tax. So we'll, we'll be watching that more closely. And this chart essentially shows um, that personal income taxes are doing really well they are above their pre-pandemic forecast. So even before the pandemic happened, um, 
you know, we had a forecast and now we think that we are well above that, um, as you can see with that red line. That's the sale, that's the, the link of tax. Any questions before sales tax? Yeah. Just before we move on to a new topic. So how did the um, Trump tax changes in 2017 impact people in Vermont um, and, you know, kind of reducing their federal liability or not reducing their federal liability? Yeah, in general, uh, most Vermont, almost at beyond 90% of Vermont taxpayers received a federal tax cut, and it was, um, say, more aggressive in nature. I have some um, some information that I've done on that, um, but by and large, higher income taxpayers saved, depending on the taxpayer, somewhere between twenty, thirty thousand dollars in federal taxes a year. But at a certain point, because Vermont was a is a relatively high tax state. Um, the cap on your ability to deduct state and local taxes is really biting on really high income taxpayers. So what you see in Vermont is, you know, people between everyone received a tax cut uh, somewhere between one and two percent of their income. If that grows as you go up through the income distribution, but as you get to really high incomes, the people who got a tax cut are much smaller. The total amount of tax cut they received is a lot smaller, and that's because state and local taxes and property taxes are higher here. And that was something they were able to deduct previously in the federal tax cuts. Now it's capped at 10,000. So they didn't actually receive much of a tax credit in Vermont um, because of the nature of our tax system. But by and large, um, I think ITEP put the total amount of uh, tax cuts saved in Vermont, at, I think something like 250 million for people over 100,000. Um, my analysis of looking at the difference in tax pay between 2018 2017 and 18, when, it, when in fact it was not that large, but it was still significant. But you have to remember that federal taxes are always, you know, significantly larger than Vermont taxes. Um, you know, federal tax rates, you know, the highest level are like 37%. They're like 8% here. So you're talking an order of four or five larger. And so you would expect those numbers to be significantly larger. Um, and so, yeah, in general, anytime there's a federal tax move, the, the dollars that we talk about are just so much higher. So, yeah, but I would say overall, everyone got a tax cut. Not everyone, but the vast majority of people got a tax cut somewhere. Than others. So, the sales and use tax, what is it? 6% on the retail sales of tangible personal property, unless exempt by law. Tangible personal property, meaning goods, more or less. Um, Graham, before you go yeah, on, I think uh, Eric had one more yeah. question on. In yeah, just, I was just thinking about that discussion, and it, it made me wonder have we. Uh, so there was the federal tax changes, and then Vermont made some tax changes in response to that. Um, do we know the net of that? The goal in Vermont, so on Vermont taxpayers? Well, so uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. On the Vermont taxpayer, the change that Vermont made in the federal. Yes. Vermont's tax change was more or less designed to be revenue neutral or not affect taxpayers. So some, some taxpayers ended up paying a little bit more in Vermont taxes. Some ended up paying a little bit less, but it was really close. I think after all those changes, the bottom line was about $2 million. So um, it was not designed to raise money. Um, and so it was designed to keep people's taxes the same as they were before in Vermont terms. Federal side, we know that they re people received very large tax credit, that or tax cut. That was the goal of the, the administration at the time. So I would say they succeeded in Vermont and they succeeded elsewhere. And all the analysis I've seen on it is that state by state, you know, pretty much everyone got a tax cut. That answers my question. We, so we'd expect those those tax cuts to have fallen through essentially completely in aggregate. Well, uh, different for each, you know, per taxpayer. It depends, per yes. That's one thing you'll hear me talk about. Just, it really depends on the taxpayer, but in aggregate, on average, we see big tax cuts at the federal level. On federal tax liabilities in Vermont after the change in 2018, it was designed to be revenue control. Sort of kept the same as they were. Thank you. Um, you all asked me really good questions. So, <laughs> uh, so it's a sales tax, a destination based tax. So it's applied to where the buyer takes possession of the item or where it's delivered. Um, that's kind of a key thing in sales taxes. Um, so it's not, say, don't say a contractor, you know, buys from a distributor. He does not pay the sales tax there. It's the person who buys from the contractor. Take, who pays the sales tax, final destination base. It does not apply to most services. Very key point. 
You go to the doctor's office, you go to the dentist, you go to pay a lawyer, accountant, none of that pays the sales tax. The only services that we tax in Vermont are small things, boot rental for ski um, rentals, um, trying to think of another one. Some laundry, I think, pays, um, pays the sales tax. So, um, and that is not exclusive to Vermont. That is a US wide phenomenon. There are, I think, two states, New Mexico, I think Hawaii, tax a good amount of services in theirs. That is US unique. Almost every country with a modern tax system has a tax applied to everything. Um, uh, so yeah, um, there's been, that's sort of one of the big topics in tax world is change from good to services um, in the economy, um, pre-pandemic I should say, um, but most state taxes aren't touching that stuff. Um, the revenues beginning in 2019 are exclusive to the education fund. So I get a lot of requests from legislators saying, I want to I want to end the exemption for this, or I want to tax this. Um, and then I say, okay, and then you're just going to be effectively lowering property tax rates. And they say, well, I didn't want to redirect it so we can pay for this in the general fund. So keep in mind that if you do anything on the sales tax, you, you know, it's education fund specific. You're taking money that would otherwise go to the property tax attack, um, to schools and moving it out. But there are exemptions of plenty within the sales tax from the base. So here's how much we collect. We collect about, um, so in fiscal year 21, we collected about $500 million. So this is a revenue stream that really popped during the COVID recession. You can see um, uh, we collected roughly over $400 million. And then fiscal year 21, we shoot right up to about $500 million. Um, so, and that's because people are staying at home. They have a lot of extra money in their pocket from you know, federal government, what are you gonna spend your money on? Fixing your home, getting a new work from home um, set up, um, gardening, things like that. All that stuff pays sales tax. Um, so we'll, we'll hit on that a little bit more. Um, so who pays the sales tax? Again, I've touched upon this, it's remitted, it's remitted by the retailer, but it's actually paid by the consumer. When I'm wondering, remember, you will have, a lot of times businesses will say, we'll come in and they'll say, I don't, you know, we can't change the sales tax because I don't want to pay it. But it's actually the consumer who pays the tax. The business actually just collects it, remits it. Um, some businesses might, you know, just charge a flat rate and then just take it off the top of the markup. Everyone does this differently, but it is the consumer who pays the, the sales tax. And businesses hold it as what is called a trust tax. They hold it onto it and they remit it on the part of the, sort of on the trust of the state. Um, so, and generally sales tax compliance in Vermont, we think is quite good. So uh, as, as much as we sort of talk about trust, it, it appears as though businesses are doing a very good job of, you know, trusting or whatever. We've entrusted our, our tax system to good stewards, I think. But there are exemptions for group, groups and goods. So there are organizations that don't pay the sales tax. The, the big one is 501c3 op, um, organizations. If they have um, sales less than uh, $20,000, um, and we, a lot of people think about 501c3 organizations, just nonprofits, but nonprofits is a huge term member in general, in, in tax world. It means hospitals, it means um, almost everything medical related in the US. Um, trying to think of other big 501c3 operations, but all the way down to, you know, your community little, you know, food shop. Um, so they're exempt if they have under $20,000 in sales. Federal, state, and local governments do not pay the sales tax state exemption certificates. And then we have purposes and goods exempted to make, usually to make the sales tax more progressive. So we're exempting items that lower income people tend to spend a greater portion of their income on. Things like clothing, groceries, medical products, all exempt from the sales tax. Um, and sales tax generally, and most consumption-based taxes, so meals and rooms, gasoline, the, cigarette taxes are considered to be progressive because lower income residents pay a higher percentage of their income on these types of goods and therefore a higher percentage of their income in sales taxes. Um, so um, what's new in the sales news tax? So the big thing that's been happening is um, internet remote sales. Prior to 2018, the Supreme Court ruled that if you are an online retailer, if you do not have a physical presence in the state that you're selling goods in, you are not expected to remit sales tax, an actual physical presence. But that was defined as things like a warehouse, a delivery truck, sales office, anything. If you had any physical presence, you were required to. But the, you know, if you think about a state like Vermont, 
if not big retailers oftentimes don't necessarily have a, a presence. So Amazon did not, doesn't have a warehouse here. Um, Amazon prior to 2018 actually sort of came into an agreement to start collecting in Vermont. Um, but the Supreme Court changed its mind um, in 2018 and basically said, um, no, um, states can now collect from sales tax from remote vendors. This idea is economic nexus. So you, if you're selling into the state, you, are, you may not have a warehouse, but you're, you're there more or less. It's just the way the economy works. Um, and they cited things like Vermont and South Dakota so that you know it's not a burden anymore as much as it used to be because Vermont um, is a member of a, an agreement which sort of defines what products are. Um, it said that states like Vermont and South Dakota um, uh, have a, a de minimis requirement. So if you make less than $150,000 in sales in Vermont, you're not required to collect the sales tax. So it, the Supreme Court basically said, well, we're not punishing these tiny remote uh, retailers anymore because most states just have these de minimis requirements and they're often in the agreements. Compliance is a lot easier. Um, there are companies set up that help collect tax, sales taxes for companies. We're in a modern time. They say that old physical nexus rules out the window. Big deal in the sales tax world. Um, but I would emphasize that it wasn't as big of a deal as you might expect because a lot of places, just a lot of big online retailers had presence in the state. Think Walmart, Home Depot, Costco, the store here. Um, so they were already collecting, but things like Amazon, eBay, um, Etsy, you know, big deal. Um, so we we estimated back in the time that we were going to we received about twenty million dollars just from that Supreme Court stroke of ten. Um, so it's a big deal, and the bigger deal I think is proven to be um, a real boost to the sales tax is what we call marketplace facilitators. So a marketplace facilitator, something like Amazon or Etsy, where they are just essentially what they call a platform where vendors list on the platform. What Vermont and other states statute said is that the vendor, if you make less than $150,000 in sales, then you're not required to collect the sales tax. And what Amazon was saying, or Etsy and eBay, for example, is they'd say, well, we don't have to collect the sales tax. Who needs to collect the sales tax? Individual little bitty people on our platform. And um, a wave of states essentially said, no, that's bogus. You are the vendor. You like you process the payments. You do the advertising for these people. You are required to collect the sales tax. That was passed in 2019. We were one of the early movers on this type of law. Um, you see a lot of it in tax rule, marketplace facilitator laws. And we said, basically, if you are acting as a marketplace facilitator, you have to collect the sales tax on behalf of the vendors. So um, huge deal because Amazon, biggest online retailer, only about 40% of their sales are directly by Amazon. The other 60% is from you know, marketplace sales. So we're missing a huge chunk of money from places like Amazon and Team eBay. And we think that that, I think we originally estimated was $15 million, just that change. And um, I know for a fact that was well underestimated um, from based upon the department tax. So marketplace facilitator law was very important. And moving on to the next point, very timely. Because the COVID-19 pandemic really changed how um, people started buying. So goods consumption, as I said, people were staying at home and buying stuff like home improvement computers. People were not going out, traveling, eating at restaurants. So they were spending all their money on goods, which means we were getting a lot of sales tax. But the key thing is a lot of this was happening online. And so e-commerce prior to the global, to pandemic, we estimated to be somewhere in the 10 to 15 percent range of total sales we think it's now about 30 35 percent just over the course of the year and you, you see states that didn't have marketplace facilitator laws in place absolutely scrambling to you know update their laws and get on board because they're just missing out on so much sales tax revenue and they need it during during those really dire times that were you know sort of circa april 2020 to august 2020 but again a lot of this is driven by federal fiscal stimulus we had bonus unemployment you know putting people in money in people's pockets, multiple rounds of federal uh, stimulus checks into people's pockets. Disposable income in during the pandemic rose to record levels. Um, so a lot of people spent that on durable goods, big expensive goods. And it was really hard to get a washing machine during the pandemic, probably still is. Um, so those things are big items, big sales tax things. And so you see that we collected just over $500 million, which is $75 million more than any previous fiscal year a big, big year, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen with sales tax once we reopen. Will we see people continue to purchase goods? So one thing is we still have a ton of disposable income sitting out in the economy. People still might be buying stuff or 
will we see more pivot back to services? People have been pent up. They're going to start going back to restaurants and traveling a lot. And we'll see sort of a drop back down to where we were before. So it's kind of, you know, an outstanding question about what's going to happen there. Yeah. Uh, perhaps I'm remembering wrong, but there have been times before uh, where in Vermont we've had a day where there hasn't been sales tax collected, right? Is that not in my recent memory? We haven't had sales tax holidays in Vermont. Some a lot of states have sales tax holidays. I think some states in the pandemic have put in place sales tax months as well. Holidays. Yeah, those so, but in my time at the year, we've never instituted a sales tax holiday. So maybe it happened in the past. I just can't remember. Yeah, we'll I think just... it was the Great Recession the last time it happened. Yeah. Okay. Isn't there something though in the Connecticut River corridor? Something there, like a sales tax holiday? Uh, not holiday, but there's something within five miles of New Hampshire where there's no sales tax. Oh, I, I, I mean, you might. I don't know if you're referring to this or not, but if you. There is sales tax. There is no sales tax in New Hampshire. Right. So if you buy something in New Hampshire, you're supposed to have them. You're supposed to pay the Vermont sales tax, and they send us. Is that what you mean? No, there was something in the last year or two. I, it doesn't matter. I, I don't remember. Yeah, I mean, maybe we're talking about use. That's the other thing I'm not talking about. Long years. The sales and use tax. The use tax yeah. is for stuff like New Hampshire, where if you go buy a washing machine in New Hampshire, you're bringing it back to Vermont. You are liable for. The Vermont sales tax on yeah. that. Compliance in Vermont is the highest in the country, but still it's you know, 15% or lower, we think. It's not very much, you know, $3 million a year in use tax. Um, but we, in the past, we've done as a way of sort of getting around this remote sellers thing, because if you recall well, before the, the Supreme Court decision, if you were buying remotely, you know, and there was no physical presence, you weren't paying sales tax on it, but you were still liable for the Vermont use tax uh, under law. And so one way that states tried to sort of get at this money was to really beef up use tax compliance. Um, I think a couple of years ago, the Department of Taxes was sent out a letter to Vermont taxpayers saying, you know, have you bought anything online, not paid sales tax? You probably owe use tax or based upon your income, we think you owe more use tax than you're putting on your income tax return. So we've seen a big jump in use tax, but it's nowhere near you know, what we actually received now that the law has been changed over. So, but yeah, so New Hampshire, the, there may be something like a use tax agreement amongst the state, but I'm not aware of it. So, so the final big tax we're gonna talk about is the corporate income tax. So what is it? So this is often a big confusion amongst the corporate income tax. People think that just the corporate income tax is the business tax. It is not, it is small, but it's the business tax that not very many businesses pay. Um, so, there are two types of businesses in tax world. A C corporation, which is a larger business, typically is, has 100 plus shareholders, oftentimes listed publicly on an exchange. It drives money from public markets. But the key thing is that the profits of the corporation accrue to the business. So like if you are Amazon, you make $100 billion. The $100 billion is the profits of Amazon, Inc. Um, and the second, type of business is what we call pass-through, is where the profits get passed through to the shareholders or the owner of the business, and then they pay a tax on those profits on their personal income tax returns. So if you heard of things like S corporations or LLCs, they're usually, usually smaller businesses, but the way it works is that you might have say 10 shareholders, they might say we made, you know, let's say a million dollars a year, each person gets $100,000, and they take that and they put it on their personal income taxes, business income, and they pay the personal income tax. Um, a sole proprietor is another example of a, a pass-through. So all the profits of the business get passed to the personal income tax or a business income. But the corporate income tax is only on the income of a C corporation, not on those pass-throughs. And the key point is that most businesses in Vermont and in the US are pass-through businesses, not C corporations. C corporations tend to be larger um, businesses, multi-state businesses. Um, I, you know, I always joke with my wife that you look at the businesses in you know, Montpelier, any town in America, almost all of them are gonna be pass-throughs. Restaurants are almost always pass-throughs, law firms pass-throughs. Um, you know, even very, even larger businesses, um, you might think of a small manufacturer, you know, maybe have two, 300 employees, they can structure themselves as an S corporation um, and pay the owners of the company or the shareholders will pay on the personal income tax. So 
I want to emphasize that this tax is only on C corps. Um, so it's it's the tax on the net income, which is a fancy term for tax for profits, profits of the business. Um, how do we treat what do we, how do we treat multi-state businesses? Taxable income, the net income, is determined by a formula using property payroll and sales. So the way we, we determine what portion of your income is based in Vermont is basically asking how much payroll do you have in Vermont as a share of your total company? How much property as a share of your total company's property do you have in Vermont? And how much sales in Vermont as a share of your company-wide sales do you have in Vermont? And essentially we take that, that formula and we come up with a number, an apportionment percentage, and that's what we tax them on. So for very large companies, that apportionment percentage might be something like 0.1%, you know, but a 0.1% of a you know, $5 billion business is still a lot of money. And then Vermont requires what's called unitary combined reporting. And so what that means is that we require companies, the way companies often structure themselves, is they have a parent company and multiple subsidiaries that operate in different states. What Vermont says is that the net income that we're going to be looking at is the net income of the parent plus all of the subsidiaries, even though subsidiary A might not operate in Vermont. We say basically everything is considered part of Vermont. So a unitary combined return is a Vermont tax return for corporate income tax. It's part of a larger company. So what you might have is say, you know, company for A, Vermont subsidiary is the filer, but on their net income, it's reporting the income of the entire group of companies. And then you have not combined returns, which are basically the subsidiary is the only company or the company is just one entity. So unitary combined returns are about 13% of total corporate income tax returns and non-combines are 87%. So most of them are smaller, non-combined returns companies. What is the corporate income tax bracket? Is a marginal bracket, but basically what I tell people, it's an eight and a half percent rate because the net income brackets there are so small. Um, you hit eight and a half percent at $25,000 for net income, not a particularly large corporation. Um, corporate income tax, how much do we collect? So corporate income tax tends to be a little bit more volatile um, from year to year. Corporations oftentimes will pay you know, a big tax liability one year and then have negative tax liability the next. It swings around a lot. Um, and we get our corporate income tax, a significant portion of it from a very small number of filers. I'm talking less than 200 filers of the 14,000 that we get. Very top heavy. And that's basically an iron law of business taxation in the US. The vast majority of the revenue comes from a very small number of tax filers. We collect about 100 and $75 million a year in corporate income tax, but you can see how it just bounces around every year. Um, but corporate was one of those, again, revenues that really beat the forecast this past year. So $51 million above forecast. It's about 7.2% of general fund revenue that year. Um, you, it, in the past, it's been around five to six. So it's, it's growing. But again, you know, next year, it could be $50 million less. Um, it really bounces around. So again, who pays the corporate income tax? Only C corporations, and most of the revenue comes from a larger, larger unitary return. So this is a, a chart from our um, our tax study from ten years, our ten year tax study from two thousand and seventeen. But you can see that you know we had sixty three hundred filers paying eleven point three million dollars of tax, and thirteen percent of filers paying eighty four percent of the tax. So very top heavy. Another law of business taxation, so not just under corporate income tax, um, I don't want to say law, but one thing that's sort of well known in tax, that businesses, that a good chunk of them do not pay any tax liability. And this is quite evident in the corporate income tax. And you probably have heard about this in the news. This is sort of starting to come out a lot. Um, but an example, in Vermont, we had 13,236 corporate filers in Vermont that year. And only about 3,000 of them had positive taxable income. So they reported an actual profit, which means only about 3,000 paid the corporate income tax as part of the brackets. So you're talking about, you know, 75 to 80% that pay either no tax. They're not paying into the brackets. What we have in place is a minimum tax regime. So if you're a corporation in Vermont and you have zero taxable income, you pay a minimum tax of but it's pretty de minimis. Um, I think it's like if you have less than two million of receipts, you pay five hundred dollars, and if you have greater than five million, you pay seven fifty. Small amount of, of money. So yeah, for for small businesses, you know, less than a hundred thousand Vermont receipts, you know, one in ten of them 
our reporting profits. When you get to some of the larger companies, just under, um, just over half are reporting profits. So that's something that like, you know, um, Democrats in Congress have started to go after. And a lot of tax world is talking about is, is net income the proper way to look at this? Because corporations, net income fluctuates from year to year. You have companies like Amazon that have a zero taxable income one year, a big number the next. Is it, is it quote unquote fair that large corporations like that should be paying zero? Sort of an outstanding question. So some states, I know Ohio's the big um, uh, one here, now tr um, uh, for corporations pay a gross receipts tax. So basically you pay on your sales, not your profits. So what, what's new here? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that's the federal tax return, our federal tax change in 2017, did a lot of corporate income tax stuff at the federal level, particularly. Lowered the rates from 35 to 21 percent. But they also made changes uh, around how you treat the profits of foreign or foreign subsidiaries of a larger company. Um, and so basically what they said is you bring that money back. You know, a lot of companies will sort of claim that this money is to a subsidiary of a corporation based in Ireland. Um, they say, if you bring that money back, you won't pay the 21%, 8%. So there's kind of an incentive for companies to bring money back. But what that led to was a big base inflation in Vermont for a couple of years, because companies were sort of like, okay, we'll pay the 8%. They bring back their money. It blows up the base in Vermont because Vermont is like that tiny 0.1% sliver. You know, if a company brings back $10 billion, you know, we, we get a chunk of that, um, albeit a tiny chunk. But we received big spikes in, in, in corporate income tax revenue in fiscal year 18, 19 um, from this. Um, companies that weren't paying anything, but are paying very small amounts. And they were large companies. And we saw all of a sudden they were paying a huge chunk of money. We think that that's what's the reason behind it. COVID-19, again, we've beaten the forecast significantly. A lot of this we think is because of federal fiscal stimulus. A lot of, you know, People spending a lot of money um, are helping boost corporate bottom lines a lot. Um, and we think there's this potential revenue bump in this year because of what we a change that we made to the tax law two years ago um, to market based sourcing. So um, this is getting really in the weeds, but somewhat important. But in corporate income tax for the sale of call intangible, so services, or um, so think things like like Expedia, selling travel services, Facebook, stuff like that. You, you have two choices. You can either say, okay, sales of, of a non-intangible um, are counted to the state where the product itself is made, or you can attribute the sales to where it's delivered. So if you think of, say, Expedia, Expedia is based in Washington state. They make, make their product, the code and everything, in Washington state. And if you're under what is called a cost performance style of in, um, attribution, that income that is made in Vermont is attributable to Washington because that's where it was made. Or you can be under a market-based sourcing regime and say, no, it's where the product was delivered. And so what we're sort of seeing, we think, is from companies that have not paying a lot, things like tech companies, finance, insurance, that don't have a lot of actual physical presence here, we're seeing a more and more larger payments for them after this change. And we think that's because of it, because before they were saying, take a bank for instance, like, we're not a bank, like, um, that's a good example, Quicken Loans, Rocket Mortgage. You know, that product itself is originated in Detroit. And so they're saying, well, under cost performance, that's a, that's a Michigan-based income source. If a Rocket Mortgage is, is originated in Vermont, but under market-based sourcing, we're saying no because it's Vermont customer that took it, that income is based in Vermont. So we're seeing sort of a jump in that. So quickly, some other revenue sources. Um, so we've talked the big landmarks, meals and rooms tax, um, another big one, 9% on, on tax on meals and rented rooms, 10% on the alcohol portion of meals served in a restaurant. We collected $143 million in this year 21. But to give you a sense of, this is one of the revenue streams that is not hit its pre-pandemic level for understandable reasons, but it was $173 million this year, 18. So we're well below what we thought, or well below what we were collecting. And beginning in fiscal year 20, 25% of those revenues go to the education fund, 69 go to the general fund, and 6% go to the clean water fund. So any change to the meals and rooms tax gets sort of sprinkled amongst the funds. 
Another big one is the cigarette and tobacco products tax. So $3.08 per pack of cigarettes um, paid at the wholesale level, 92% um, of the wholesale price for other tobacco products. So um, the big change here was that in 2019, we applied that tobacco products tax to e-cigarettes. Um, and that has been a significantly higher revenue stream than we thought. I guess we've been sort of saying that it's it's good because we have a lot more money, but it's bad because it means that we're <laughs> people are using e-cigarettes a lot more than we think they are or thought they were. So we in total, tobacco taxes are about $77 million, and that's all general fund revenue. And another big one is insurance premiums. Um, something I didn't know before I moved here is Vermont is actually a very favorable state for insurance companies, particularly captive insurance companies. Um, and they pay 2% per year on the gross amount of the premiums that they write in Vermont. And that's paid in lieu of the corporate income tax. So insurance companies here do not pay the corporate income tax, they pay the insurance premiums tax. We collected about $60 million of that. Um, and that's all generous. That's all dedicated to the general fund. So this, this chart here, our table is essentially Tom Cavett's forecast from 20, January 2021. But you get a sense of just the, all the other tax revenue sources in the general fund. Um, that are available. So we have, you know, meal dreams. We also have a tax on liquor. We have a tax on beer. We have a tax on estates, um, things like that. I'm not touching on those today, but if you have other questions about those, I can follow up sort of after. Yeah. On the insurance, so since we're only paying 2% per year instead of the corporate income tax, would, would we be collecting more money if they were paying the corporate income tax? It's 2% on the, the premium written. So it's not necessarily profit. So it's difficult to say whether we'd be collecting more or less if we're on the corporate income tax. Because premiums written is essentially here's how much we are insuring, you know, whatever. But like a Vermont mutual or union mutual, typically when they write theirs, they're looking for like a five percent income piece there after they pay out their bills and other stuff. So fifteen percent or eight percent of their five percent is a lot less than two percent of their one hundred percent. Yeah, but like let's say there's a disaster, right? you know, and insurance companies have to pay out a lot of money to Vermont, you know, then their profits in a given year might be negative, you know, a lot. Um, and so it kind of depends on the year. A couple of years ago, I was asked to analyze whether banks, so banks right now pay in Vermont, if you're domiciled here, you have deposits, you pay 0.0096% on the average monthly deposits in your bank as a tax, the bank franchise tax. And I was asked a couple of years ago to estimate if we switch them to the corporate income tax, we make more money. And the answer is no. We are getting more banks from the bank franchise tax than we are from the corporate income tax. And it would affect something like anywhere between five and $10 million revenue loss if we did that. So, it's yeah. Insurance change, that almost seems like a industry specific change from income based to a receipts based model. That, I mean, I guess you sort of characterize it that, that way. It's sort of a receipts based um, tax. It's on premiums, right. so yeah, it's it's different than a, an income tax. Um, so we're past the top of that table. I guess this is part of the presentation. I think um, Chris directed me to a lot. So here are some hot topic revenue ideas that I've done some work on. Um, the first is cannabis tax. I get a lot of requests from you know legislators and the public on well, how much can we get if we tax um, cannabis? So I'll, and as everyone in this room is probably aware that S54, I can't remember what act it ended up being, but um, Vermont has legalized the sale of retail cannabis. Um, and our estimates are we think that sometime in fiscal year 23. So we're still, still kind of a, I don't know, shaky timeline. We don't know exactly when the first sales will be happening, but fiscal year 23 corresponds to um, calendars years 22 and 23. So it could happen in late calendar year 22 or um, early calendar year 23 is sort of our guess. But this was the estimate of revenue that we thought we could collect um, from uh, cannabis sales. And this was based upon a model that myself and the tax department put together, but also cross-referencing with the other states have collected. So um, I, there's a chart in the fiscal note that essentially compares if you scale other states down their population to what ours is and what their revenue they collected, this is essentially more or less pretty close. To what, so you might hear numbers like, oh, Michigan collected $300 million of cannabis tax. That's because Michigan has, you know, 15 times the size of our population. Um, so uh, this were, these are our revenue estimates. So you're talking somewhere between on the, you know, on the high end, what's the market we think is fully online at fiscal year 25, 
$13 million on the low end and $25-ish million on the high end. We could be way off on that. JFO misses on estimates all the time. <laughs> That's not something that is crazy. These are, I would just say that if we do beat it by a lot, it will be because Vermont um, cannabis users are a lot higher than any other state. Um, because again, we based a lot of our estimates. We already know that. We know that. Right. We've already accounted for that in our model, but it would be looking at, it would be well above what other states had done. So even Colorado, right? So like in that chart, we sort of compared what Colorado's money would be in Vermont terms with the same tax rate. And it's about in this range. So I think I said something like, um, if we end up on the low end of this range, we will be something like, uh, I think it was Washington, which had a really rocky um, outroll of their marijuana market. If we're on the high end, then we'll be something like Colorado. And Colorado being known basically as the you know the first state to do this nowadays that i think as the latest number like 13 or 14 states have legalized cannabis sales maine being the newest one in, in new england massachusetts has been selling for the past two years or so um so the first mover advantage is not there anymore um, like it is for colorado sports gambling yeah one question on that um so as currently in statute would these revenues go, go to the general fund? Or similar to the great the question. Not all of them. No, not all of them. So there's two separate taxes here. We're talking. We're talking about a 14% excise tax, which is what is on the, the sale of cannabis. Plus, we're applying the six percent sales tax because we consider this a tangible, um, a tangible piece of personal property. Six percent. That six percent piece goes to the education fund. That's just the normal sales tax regime. On the 14% tax, 70% of that is dedicated. <laughs> I think 70% is dedicated to the general fund and 30% goes to a um, substance misuse and prevention fund. Um, I think that substance misuse and prevention fund is capped at 10 a year. So any amount over that would go into the general fund. A lot of, there's been a lot of cannabis stuff moving as you guys know <laughs> and doing that it's, it's it's been a long slog. Uh, <laughs> 15 so there's, years? there's so many things in my head remembering you know, what exactly actually passed. The next biggest one I hear a lot about is sports gambling. Um, so we have not done a formal estimate on how much sports gambling, and a lot of it depends on what is actually what gets put into place. A lot of states have a ton of different regimes. Some people essentially operate like a liquor control model where you have a sports book and they take the book, the the bets and whatever money they make, they send a chunk back to the uh, back to the state. Other states will um, have essentially a, a tax on the gross receipts of the sports book that, that, um, that is operating in the state. So there are lots of different models here, lots of different tax rates. We haven't formally done nested on this because there, there has been a bill, but it hasn't really moved anywhere yet. So, but there is a study coming out in October by JFO and Ledge Council that is looking at the issues and putting some money um, around money parameters, what was collected in other states. But what I can, yeah. Just curious, do we know what our sister state next door did? How did New Hampshire do with revenue? I'm trying, oh, I don't know what the number is. I'm trying to remember the regime. I think they did a sort of standard 10%, I think it's 10% on the, uh, on the receipts of the sports club. That's their model. And I think, so this two and a half million dollar figure you see here is, was in the administration budget proposal last year. Um, and I was told that that was based upon a scale down of New Hampshire's experience. So I don't know if you recall the that. Uh, so the, I think, yes, yeah, so New Hampshire, I mean, they, they got the contract with DraftKings, right? And uh, and they, and DraftKings and, and New Hampshire. So New Hampshire didn't set up an infrastructure. It was like DraftKings infrastructure. And then they share the revenue. You know, I think it came online in like January 2020. And then, you know, there were no sports for, for, for a long time. <laughs> there was that issue. But I was trying to get that same question myself. It seemed like maybe um, the revenue was like three to four million in a high month um, for New Hampshire. But they also say that, you know, 40 to 50 percent of their sales are people from Massachusetts coming up to go to New Hampshire. to put. So it's hard to I think it's going to be hard for this study to determine that number. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah. see. <laughs> um, but there are just other factors at play here. So we have New Hampshire right there in the border. Um, but the other thing is Vermont's a quite um, aged population. And so you might lower the actual amount of estimates going on because those people don't tend to gamble as much, particularly on sports events. 
Um, and so I think that was based, so I, the numbers I had seen coming from New Hampshire were higher than two and a half million a year, but I think rightfully the administration was conservative and lowering it down. But the, the sort of message I would convey here is we're not talking huge dollars here. We're not talking a, you know, uh, you know, a savior for general fund problems, particularly in the size of dollars that you guys are talking about. Not, not anything really. The final one that I've done a fair amount of work on is what are called high income tax surcharges. Um, and generally what I've estimated on these are essentially a simple surcharge that applies to directly to AGI. So we don't have to worry about any of that standard deduction or personal exemption or capital gain stuff. It's directly on income. So very sort of simple one to 3% surcharge on incomes on the value of the dollars over a certain amount. And I've done many different iterations of this, but here are three of them. So imagine a 3% surcharge rate on any dollars of adjusted gross income over 300,000. We preliminarily estimated that was about 60 to 70 million a year. One and a half percent tax rate on AGI over 150, 30, 40 million. 3% surcharge on AGI over 500,000 is about uh, 40 to 50 million a year um, on a tax rate like that. So you're talking some pretty serious dollars there, um, but I would I would um, lay down some, some considerations for this committee and for legislators who have thought about this. First, is the per, as I've talked about, the personal income tax is already quite top heavy as it is. And doing this would, you'd be stacking another 30 to $60 million on top um, of that very small work for, you know, 1% top, 1% we're talking about somewhere around three to 5,000 taxpayers of the 300 and 320,000 resident returns. Um, we get about 380,000 um, total returns a year. Um, 500,000, you're talking, you know, anywhere between one to 3,000 taxpayers. So a sm very small share um, that you're relying on there. And the very progressive systems, especially at that level, are very prone to volatility because of things like capital gains. A lot of the people who are making money up there sometimes I think on average, half of their income is from capital gains, and that stuff just bounces around a lot. It's unpredictable. So these numbers you see here, I'm putting a range around them, but it's plausible that you know, say that sixty to seventy million of that could come in at forty, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't blink an eye and say, okay, that sounds about right. Um, I go to revenue conferences every year, and you know, at least one a year is like, here's how we try to figure out cap, how to forecast capital gains. Turns out we can't do it. Like, <laughs> so um, it's really tough to do. The other considerations I'd say that if, if one of these were put in place, only two to three states would have income tax rates that would be near that level. Um, and, and you know some of the income levels here, Vermont would be the highest income tax state in the country. California notoriously has high income tax rates, but their highest rates really kick in at like ten million dollars of income. Um, you know, really high stuff. Hawaii's I think is probably the high. If I were making a judgment call, it's probably the highest income tax state because they're um, I think they're like nine or ten percent. It kicks in at like two hundred thousand dollars. So um, I think I when I did the Hawaii's on an island, three thousand miles from another state. It's true. I mean, they don't have a border with New Hampshire. <laughs> People can move very quickly. So um, I think when I did this, it was something like if you did the three percent on the age of your three hundred thousand, Vermont or Hawaii would be higher than Vermont up to 300. And then between three and five, Vermont would be the highest. And then after that, California would be the highest. So it kind of depends on how much income. But you're talking about a sort of select group of states uh, there that have significantly different economies than Vermont, significantly larger, I would, probably, I would say. Um, and then finally, fiscal and monetary policy paid a huge impact on these groups. So like I mentioned earlier, tax changes, right? If there's a change in tax rates being proposed, you see a bunch of high-income people realizing capital gains in one year, and then you get nothing the next year. You see shifts of income all over the place. You see things right now, we have really low interest rates, so high capital gains. But what if the Fed starts to increase interest rates? You might see asset prices fall a lot, and therefore capital gains just completely fall off the cliff. Um, so these do raise a fair amount of money, um, but I would say it's not without, it's not sort of, and easy. Well, why haven't we done this already? There's lots of considerations, not to mention things like we have a state, you know, less than 100 miles away that doesn't have an income tax at all. Um, so, so we could have an attempt to amend the bill that created this task force to add a well surcharge. Did not pass the House, 
So the one thing to keep in mind is the political feasibility uh, of doing a tax increase, um, you know, whether the legislator would support it or the governor. So that's something to keep in mind. So what's our, we are, um, I'm realizing that it's 12.15 and um, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> and, and so our, we can, I don't know how much you have left, but I think these are important. And so if um, people are flagging here a little bit, um, are you are able you to come back at one to finish your slides and, and questions? Um, let me just double check. I, I think I may have a meeting. Um, I cannot be here. Okay. okay. So I have a time constraint about 12. 30 so well let's see if let's, we can cruise through that and then let's go until 12 30. I, I will try to give this the quick treatment although i do think it's important so the yeah, last thing i'm going to talk about here is tax expenditures yeah one more thing on on the revenue right yeah. on the surcharge did jfo do a note an analysis on this because that might help us um, did not do sort of a formal fiscal note this was a lot of these were done in um, basically on four amendments. So I was essentially giving a preliminary numbers so that people could have information on four. I do not have formal estimates of these things because they there are a couple of bills out there that I've given estimates or uh, informally, but none of them have moved in any of the committees. Um, so I haven't written a fiscal note on them just yet. Yeah. Now we have more to get through just before moving on. Do you have information that you could get to us about taxpayer uh, migration in and out of the state? I do yeah i um two summers ago wrote two issue briefs examining that question and i can send them to you bottom line is that we did not find uh, evidence of taxpayers moving in and out of state because of tax rates in fact our biggest problem uh, appeared to be amongst taxpayers with sort of lower middle income that were aged between the ages of like 50 and 65. um our best strength was actually on Relative, we've lost a fair number of taxpayers over time. Our strength was amongst higher income taxpayers and particularly young higher income taxpayers. So um, I can send those to you. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So tax expenditures. Um, these are basically statutory provisions which reduce the amount of revenue that would otherwise be collected, and they're usually done to encourage some sort of activity or advances some sort of group. So, example of a tax expenditure is tax credit or deduction. So, the earned income tax credit reduces the revenue available in the personal income tax. Social security deduction, where you know we've identified seniors as an area where we want to reduce their tax liability, so we we put that in the statute, but it lowers our revenues. And then there's exemptions from the tax base. So, example of that is clothing being exempt from the sales tax base. We don't tax clothing. Every two years, we have to estimate how much these cost the state. So that's what these three charts show you. So on the personal income tax side, we estimate the personal income tax expenditures are about $315 million a year. The vast majority of that is the Vermont standard deduction and Vermont personal exemption. I kind of say those are more or less mechanical types of tax expenditures, but they're technically, but they're not, the, the group is that they favor are so broad that they almost categorize it's just sort of a tweaking of the tax policy so um, the real tax expenditures i would say are the earned income tax credit the capital gains exclusion the vermont charitable tax credit social security exemption others um, so you can see the earned income tax credit the largest one that we have um, capital gains exclusion between 15 and 20 million dollars a year charitable tax credit about 10, 9 to 10. the social security exemption i like to highlight this one a lot because Vermont's aging population makes this one grow really fast. Um, so when I estimate this is fiscal year 2019, it was put into law in fiscal 18. It was $5 million then. It's $5.5 million in fiscal 19. Preliminary, I've estimated about $6.5 million this year. So it's growing about $500,000 a year um, or more because more and more people, A, are retiring, um, the aging population. B, the people who are on Social Security now have had higher incomes than the ones before. And so their social security checks are higher. And so the amount that we're exempting is higher. Um, sales tax exemptions. I mentioned there are exemptions of plenty here. $267.8 million of sales tax exemptions. Right? We collect about um, 500-ish million dollars of sales tax. So you're talking about an additional 50% we estimate 
Um, some of these we just can't estimate, have no data. Um, you know, and these are estimates, so they're not hard data. But groceries is the biggest one, about $90 million a year. We think we're not collecting by not taxing groceries. Energy purchases for a residence, so any propane, fuel oil, you know, electricity that you, you buy for a resident, not taxed. Clothing and footwear, another 33 million. Medical products, 54.8. Agricultural inputs, 16.9. And then a, a slew of others, about 34. <laughs> Pretty big dollars, but a lot of those are just, are put in place policies by the legislature to make the sales tax less progressive. And then amongst the property tax, we, we estimate about $94 million of, of expenditures. This one is a little bit squishier because for properties that aren't that are tax exempt, it's not like the appraiser goes around and appraises them every year. They're like, well, why do we need to appraise a church never taxed? Um, so take that with a grain of salt. But the big ones that you see are UEM and the state colleges, about 20. Um, private colleges. So the big ones there are Middlebury and Norwich account for about 14 of that, that's $18 million. Just those two universities account for the vast majority of private colleges. Um, pious organizations, that's churches, and, but also things like orphanages run by, um, by pious organizations. Private slash public schools. This one was new to me when I so I did a review of this tax, this, uh, the property tax expenditures for public, pious, and charitable organizations. Um, a lot of these are for um, private or independent schools. So think Burton, Burton or uh, St. Johnsbury Academy. There's one in St. Albans, I'm trying to remember. Um, but yeah, um, $6.7 million. Uh, hospitals, $15 million a year to the state. So the big one there being UVM Medical Center, but also any other hospital. They are all nonprofits in the state, um, so they do not pay. And then tax increment financing districts at uh, six million dollars. So, what is that? if I missed that? What was it? It's tax tax increment financing districts. It's a it's an economic development tool that allows for municipalities to essentially keep um, state education fund dollars to finance um, infrastructure development. So, so yeah. So basically, if a uh... If a town has zero dollars development in this area, borrows the money to develop an area, and it goes on the tax roll for the twenty years of the bond, they can use all the tax revenue to pay off the bond. But then, at, but well, not all. Some of that still goes to the Ed Fund, and then the whole point is, in twenty years, that all then goes to the Ed Fund. So, the concept behind that is you don't get that economic development without that, that uh, that investment locally with that debt. And so it, it's still a net positive scene to the, the actual property tax. So while it shows an expense, I know in St. Albans, they probably added $70 million to the jet, the, the grand list in St. Albans City. So yeah, we might be eating $200,000 a year and, or a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in St. Albans, it'll look like a tax expense. That 70 million in another 10 years at this point will end up going into the full fund to pay for schools and other things that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Yeah, that's, uh, I'd say TIF districts are one of the sort of more controversial things in the state. I think basically centers around whether equal people development happen without the use of the education fund. Won't get into that it's another day, but um, for the purposes of calculating these expenditures, and I have to present to the emergency board, the governor and the money chairs, um, this, this TIF district number every year. Um, and it, that assumes, it, the, what we're told to do is assume that all of it would happen otherwise. So it's basically education fund. Again, I'm not gonna get into that today, but that's, <laughs> that's what we estimated. Um, and then finally, resources. If you have any questions, here are some resources that you can look into if you wanna look into more tax stuff, and then you can always contact me with any questions. So I appreciate everyone's Any questions, final questions for today? Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, we're getting a late start on lunch, um, but I also don't want to entirely shortchange our afternoon conversations because we're going to need to bump Chris Roop's um, discussion to uh, to right after lunch. So, can we um, we reconvene at one fifteen? So we do a 50 minute lunch break instead of an hour.